Good morning. Welcome to worship. I wanted to share something that I heard yesterday on, uh, I was listening to Christian radio in my car, and they said, uh, someone said, there are two times when we should worship God, when we feel like it and when we don't feel like it. So we're going to worship God this morning, whether we feel like it or not, and I hope you feel like it, um, because scripture says to us, give things in all circumstances, for this is God's give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. God is so, so good in all circumstances. So it is good for us this week as we approach Thanksgiving to just think about all our blessings and um, leave our troubles, leave our troubles out of it, uh, or lay them at the cross, lay them on the altar. And uh, we are going to lift up the name of Jesus this morning. So we invite you to stand um, as we sing and Give him all the glory. He is so good.
scripture says that uh, God inhabits the, the, the praises of his people. And so when we lift up our praise here this morning, whether either silently in our hearts or, or whether uh, uh, out loud, uh, we know we give God a, a place to dwell, a God, a place to be. And we know wherever God is, wherever his presence is, is at, uh, that he's doing great things, that he's healing hearts. Uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that each one of us bring our own baggage in here this morning. Amen? I mean, that's probably one thing we can easily agree on. Even if we never met each other this morning, we come in with some sort of baggage. Could be our own, could be somebody else's that we're, we're pulling along ourselves. And so when we give God a, a place to be, uh, we know that he's touching those situations and he's taking our eyes off of the situations. He's putting them on himself. And wherever the presence of the Lord is, uh, there is a peace that we can't get any other way. As we think about those trials and we think about those troubles and maybe the things that are on your mind this morning, you can think of the things that God has already brought you through. And you can say, Lord, great is your faithfulness unto me.
so good. And we really could just sing of your love forever and ever. And even then, we still couldn't grasp the amount of love you have for us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you that you are so, so good. Lord, we praise you in our trials because we know that you bring us through the fire to refine us and to shape us and to bring us out on the other side as stronger people for your will. Lord, as we come into this Thanksgiving week, we are so grateful for the blessings in our lives, Lord, because we know that they come from you. Lord, help us to be grateful for the trials and the baggage and the things that we face every day because you use them for your will and your purpose. Lord, we truly could sing of your love forever. And even then, it wouldn't be enough. We thank you, we praise you, and we love you. Amen. Good morning. As you are seated this morning, please turn and greet your neighbors. Hey, good morning. Good morning. We do want to say a special welcome to you to Trinity today, especially all of you who are, are new or first-time visitors with us. I'm Steve. I'm Chad. And we are here to just let you know of some of the things that are going on. So if you are a visitor with us, we'd love you to take the tear-off part of the bulletin and fill it out and um, take it out to the Welcome Center. They have a special gift for you. But I also want to let you know that while the ushers are getting ready to take up the offering, while we're doing special uh, you know, all the events that are going on. If you are a guest, don't feel obligated to put anything in the offering plate. Your gift to us today is being here to worship with us, and we thank you so much for that. That tear-off part is a, a great place for you to write your prayer requests also. Anything at all you would like us as a staff and as a prayer team to pray with you for this week, make sure you write it down and you give it to us in the office, bring it up late on the kneeling rails, hand it to me, get it to us so we can pray with you for those things this week. Lots of things going on around Lots the of things. Uh, back by special request, we're going to extend the photo directory one more weekend. So next Sunday uh, will be the last weekend. Um, so if you haven't been able to get your family in, maybe they've been out, this is a great time following the holiday to do a family picture for the photo directory. So next week, next make sure week. if you haven't done it, do it now. That is correct. Also, the our prayer experience in the atrium and out in the back hallway is still up. If you have not had the opportunity to visit the prayer wall, the, uh, the family tree, prayer tree, or the thankful cross, make sure you do that. I encourage you to do it with your family. But go there, enjoy those prayer experiences. They are powerful, and it's a very, very good thing for you to do. And then if you'd like to join the Christmas choir along with Steve and everyone else, um, you're you're doing it, right? I got it. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, but if you would like to be a part of that, uh, there's sign-ups in the atrium for the Christmas choir happening on Christmas Eve during the 7 and the 11 p.m. service. So you can still sign up today. Next Sunday, we'll start practices. For more information, make sure you go see Bryce about that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And you know what, Chad? This, this is my favorite third service. You know that? Yes, it is. These it's guys my are favorite awesome. Too. You know how awesome they are? Oh, I I thought he was coming up to, for us to put offering in. I didn't know what he was doing there. I thought he was going to yeah. let me pray over it. Hey, <laughs> that's right. Hey, we, we do have, um, we're, we're back to the old uh, chair stacking now because of the carpet is in and everything is set. So if you could please help us at the end of the service, stack the chairs five high because they're all going to stay in here. Please do not slide them. Okay, we're going to have the carts in here. Once we stack them, we'll use the carts and we can move them put them around all the walls or everything just like we used to do. I really, really want to say a thank you to all of you who have helped us the last few weeks with all the crazy different ways we've had to stack them. Thank you so very much. And, and as usual, there's lots of things going on. Make sure you take time to check your bulletin out, check the featured ministry table to see where God would have you plug in to the ministries of this church. 
I'm also looking forward, Steve, to our new small groups that are going to be happening here, going along uh, with a sermon series starting in January. It's called Divine Direction. And so uh, we, we ask everyone, if you're not part of a small group, we, we would love for you to be a part of it. You can find out more information out in the atrium. But with that, let's just, here's a little uh, promo video about what Divine Direction is going to be about. Order the buckler and shield and prepare for battle. Right, that's a quick little uh, promo for our upcoming January and February series called Divine Direction. There's information in your bulletin. And uh, all of us are always thinking, God, what do you want me to do? And so as we begin a new year, we're going to start that in our small group and sermon series. And we would love for you to be a part of that sermon uh, series and small group. So it gives you a couple of weeks to think about it and uh, then plan to be a part of it uh, when we get to the new year. This morning, we are going to do a sermon, just a, just a one-time sermon. Uh, I have had uh, didn't preach last week because we had uh, Encounter Revival here, had a great week with Encounter Revival. So I've had two weeks to work up a, a, a sermon about the most important things that we deal with. So here we go this morning. We are going to talk about Christian principles for spiritual warfare and church security, cup lids, and carpet stains. That's our subject for our sermon today. Because we got some things we got to talk about. We got to open our Bible, say, God, what sort of things do you say that really matter to us? This is why we read God's word. This is why we study God's word. Not just to know about then and there, but to say, God, take the then and there and help me apply it to here and now. Help me understand what you wrote to the church in Corinth and understand what it means to Trinity Evangelical. Explain to me how food sacrificed to idols helps us understand our donut bar. Help me understand what it is to live with each other in 2017 that was just as relevant in the year 17. And so uh, this morning, we're going to do a lot of scripture. We're going to do it really fast. So I've actually got a whole bunch of sheets back there. If somebody would help our school teacher, uh, we're going to pass out uh, sheets. You were a school teacher, Steve. You're good at this. Uh, we're going to pass out a whole bunch of, uh, well, we're going to pass one sheet to each of you, which means a whole bunch uh, of uh, sheets that have all the scripture on it, or at least most of it, that I'm going to reference today. Because hopefully you brought your Bibles, hopefully you'd follow along, but if not, this gives you a chance to, to make sure you can read the scripture and then go back and look it up and follow along because there's nothing worse than somebody who would use this scripture out of context, right? We're going to talk about that as well a little bit too. So uh, we're going to give you a sheet. It's going to give you the scripture. You can follow along in your Bibles. You got sermon notes. Uh, our uh, memory verse for the week uh, is this though. If, if you don't take anything else out, I want you to get Philippians 4. 6 and 7. In Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, it says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. If you don't have any other scripture that you take from today, I want you to take that one. If you need a scripture to take you into Thanksgiving this week, I want you to take that one. Uh, when the pilgrims celebrated what would be the first Thanksgiving for them in this country, they didn't do it in the midst of, of a, a great revival. They did it in Thanksgiving for survival. Uh, when George Washington declared Thanksgiving for this nation at its birth, he did it in the midst of the, the great losses and danger of that Revolutionary War. And when Abraham Lincoln declared it a national day of Thanksgiving in November, he did it in 1863, in the middle of the Civil War. Thanksgiving for our country is to be a reminder of God's goodness, his faithfulness to us, not because we have so many things, but because God's power is able to carry us through great trials. And so as you go into Thanksgiving this week, I don't know what makes you anxious or what you have to give to God, but the word tells us to be anxious, to not be anxious about anything, but in every situation to present uh, our, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, to present our request to God. And then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard our hearts 
and our minds in Christ Jesus. So that's where I want you to start as we talk about our current church security plan. Uh, Two weeks ago, there was a horrific shooting down in Texas at a church, and it causes all sorts of questions and conversations about what does it mean for us to worship in our church, in, in any church, Uh, There's all sorts of uh, links and websites and articles you can read. So I want to share with you just very briefly this morning a little bit about what our church security plan is. And the first thing in our plan is this. We ask you to pray. Before I talk about any other physical part of the plan or the building, I would tell you that as Christians, we believe prayer has power. And we believe there is a God who is at work in all things. And so prayer is powerful and effective. Now the world doesn't understand that. There were some some incredibly ignorant statements by people two weeks ago about prayer and why did people pray and why would people worship a God that would uh, let something like that happen. But that's because they, they don't fully understand that God is bigger than just this life and that we don't pray because we get what we want. We pray because it brings us closer to the God who we love. Uh, In the book of Job, it says that God had placed a hedge of protection around Job. Of course, that hedge of protection, Satan asked to be removed because he told God the only reason why Job believed was because he had so much stuff and was so safe. And so we can pray for a hedge of protection, but it's not what causes us to love God. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is taken by Satan in one of the temptations in the wilderness to a high place. It says the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The devil is quoting from the Psalms. He's quoting Psalm 91. And Psalm 91 is a great psalm of protection. If you're in a dangerous place or a dangerous time, Psalm 91 is a great psalm to read. I had one of our Navy veterans who told me on, on their ship, that was the verse, the, the, the scripture, the chaplain gave to them the first day they got on board, Psalm 91. But the devil uses that thought of physical safety to tempt Jesus to do something that he shouldn't do. And so we don't want to fall into the temptation that that God will simply take care of us and we don't have to do anything or to put ourselves in foolish situations. And so Jesus answered the devil. He said, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so there are wise and right things that we do in order to say we want to be as safe as possible. The first thing I would tell you is this, to keep watch, to keep your eyes open, to be aware of your situation. And that's not just in the church building, it's life. It's anywhere you go. In this day and age, if you see something suspicious, you should say something. If you hear somebody say, you know what, that pastor is so lousy, I want to go shoot him, you should tell me. You should give me a heads up on that situation because we would take precautions. I would preach shorter sermons or something. If you hear things or see things that are not as they should be, you report them. And in our world today, that's uh, perhaps more relevant than ever. And so I would tell you one of the reasons why we have greeters who stand at the door or check-in people who are at the West End is not just hospitality, although that's primarily why they're there. If you don't know that there are means of security, you should. There are video cameras that are all throughout this building, and we have an emergency call system that would immediately uh, call for police help if we needed it. There are a number of things that we have, but all of those things start with your willingness to keep watch. Now, what's true physically is also true spiritually. Jesus was concerned not about those who would kill the body, but about those who would kill your soul. And so Jesus says the same thing in Luke 20, verse 21, verse 36. He says, be always on the watch. Jesus didn't mean for just uh, those who might hurt you physically. He was concerned about the sins that would attack you spiritually. And here was the advice Jesus had as you keep watch. His advice is to exit. His advice is to exit. Now, in this building, we have exits for you. 
Uh, I'm glad you're traveling here with us today. We hope you've been well taken care of. In case of an emergency, I have exits here to the front and to the side and to the back of the cabin and directly behind you. In case of a water emergency, no, that's a different speech, right? There are exits in this room, and you should, at least from time to time, take a look at where they're at. Because if something would happen, there are a number of ways to get out. And when we have medical emergencies, as has happened occasionally, we ask people to exit through the side doors to leave room for the ambulance and the EMTs to come through the main doors and to bring the cot in. Uh, I should also tell you, through these main wooden doors, the solid wooden doors up front, uh, there are staircases that go up to the furnace rooms. And if you all squeezed really close together, you could all fit upstairs in the furnace rooms. You really could. And so there is a, a secondary place of hiding in the building if you would ever need it. And so I want you to make sure you know that this building is designed with multiple exits. Not like older churches that would only have one door in and out, but rather a multitude of exits to allow you to escape. Spiritually, Jesus said this as he continued in Luke 21, 36. He said, be always on the watch and pray that you might be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus does not intend us to live our lives trapped by the sinfulness of this world. Jesus intends for us to find ways, to pray for ways, to intentionally look for, say, God, how do I escape those things that you do not intend me to be a part of? And so as true as it would be physically in this building, I want to tell you spiritually, if you're in a struggle, if you're feeling trapped or in bondage to the sins that so easily entangle us, God has promised that no sin has overtaken you except that which is common to man and that he provides a way out for every person. So look for the exits. Don't let yourself get trapped. Uh, next, I want to tell you this. You should know your role. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, all its many parts form one body, and so it is with Christ. Uh, in our congregations, we are blessed with people who have a m variety of jobs, a multitude of roles. Uh, some of you are school teachers, some of you uh, work in factories, some of you uh, stay at home and take care of children. There are any number of sacred professions that God calls us to, and each one is necessary. Some of you are called as medical personnel, and when we've had medical emergencies, you've every time stepped up. And if we would have a safety emergency, in every service we have law enforcement personnel. In all of our services, I can tell you that we have sheriff's deputies and police officers and uh, state highway patrol officers and any number of folks who in their daily lives, and you know this if you're one of them, are authorized to handle emergency situations. And if something would happen that we would need that sort of help, I trust you would step in, right? I could only preach them to death. That would not be very helpful, right? And so if something would happen, if you're a law enforcement personnel, you understand that you would rise to that occasion and make wise decisions. And if you are not, you understand that your role would be something different. And so in every situation, we bring before God with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, so that he might care for us. Some of you aren't law enforcement personnel, but, but you should sing in the choir. You could teach Sunday school. And some of you can help stack chairs at the end of service. Uh, there is any number of things within the body of Christ that we are called to do. And every one of us has a place where we belong. Now, here's the hardest thing to teach in emergency situations. And so even professionals go over this over and over and over again. And that is to stay calm. Right? The reason we pray, the reason we talk about this today is so that in the event of an emergency, I want you to realize that you should have a peace. That, that's not natural. It's not what you do naturally, but you practice it and you come before God and you pray for it. Uh, some of you have moments of emergencies in your life. For some of you, uh, this week with family for Thanksgiving is going to be an emergency situation. And I want you to practice right now to take a deep breath and say, Lord, I will stay calm. Doesn't matter what they say, who they bring up, what they say about my food, what they say about my house, what they say about my life, right? I'm going to stay calm. I'm going to be a witness for Christ. 
Philippians 4, 6 and 7 is our memory verse. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In this world today, we are in need of people whose witness as followers of Christ is their ability to say the evilness, the darkness, and the sin of this world will not overcome. That we believe that indeed God is the victor of all things. And as followers of Jesus, we ultimately have nothing to fear. But that is not our natural reaction. And it's certainly not the reaction the devil wants from us. The devil would like to deceive you into being constantly fearful, always anxious. And the word of God says that is not how we should live. We are called to be a light, a light in this dark world. In the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus preaches about what it is to follow him, he says that that we are called to be a city on a hill and that uh, when you have a light, you shouldn't hide it under a bushel. No, he didn't sing it, but that's where you get the song from, if you didn't know. And in Matthew 5, 16, he continues and says, let your light shine before others that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The ultimate victory of the kingdom of God is not not simply to make people behave in this world. It is to overcome this world. It is to be a light in the darkness. And there is nothing the darkness can do to fight the light. And so God calls us in this world to be people who shine his light, to show his glory to this world. Long before anyone picks up a gun and does something violent, there should be a community of people who surround them, who love them, who talk to them about God's plan for their life. In your schools, where you work, where you meet people in the community, There is opportunity for us long before anything would happen that we would even know about for God to plant a seed and to change the course of lives. That's the ultimate security plan that God offers to us. And that when the day comes that someone or somehow this body no longer functions, I know where I would go. And in heaven, we would be alive forevermore. That's the confidence of those who follow Christ. And so, in short, that's our current church security plan. That's, that's sort of the thumbnail sketch that I can give you. So if you're an usher or a greeter, if you volunteer to be out front, or if you work back at the check-in station, you realize it's not, just, it's not just as simple as you thought it was. It comes with great responsibility. And we thank you for serving in that way. Let me transition from talking about our church security plan to talking about an even more pressing issue, and that is cup lids and carpet stains. So go ahead and look at somebody around you and say, mmm, new carpet. Yeah, you can smell it. Mmm, it's all done this week, right? The last couple of weeks, you all have been putting up chairs and helping us do, do things with the chairs to get stuff in and out because we had to clear out all of our space and put new carpet down. We've got new lines. The lines are, are just a little bit raised. If, if you're close to a line or when you leave today, you can kind of rub your foot over the line and it's just, it's just slightly raised so that if, if you're going to go out of bounds playing basketball, you're going to feel that line. So there's a little bit of help to that there. But what it means is when we scoot the chairs, the chairs could tear up those lines. So that's, that's why we don't want you to scoot the chairs anymore to try to avoid tearing up those lines for us. Uh, but because we have new carpet, we need to talk about a few things that go along with it. And now, problems in churches is nothing new. In fact, if you read your Bibles, all of Paul's letters, with the exception of Philippians, are written to churches to address their problems, to say, as followers of Jesus, this is how you should live. And we're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, for quite a few of our verses here. And the church in Corinth was a total mess. They were divided about their leadership. They didn't understand how how to reach out for hospitality. They didn't know who should eat the food that people brought from the other temples in town. Whew, if you think we got problems, they would have been glad to have our problems. And Paul writes a number of words of instruction to them that are still good for us. And so uh, the very first one out of 1 Corinthians is this, and that is to give God the glory. 
No matter what we do or what we choose to do or how we choose to do it, the starting point for the church in Corinth was this in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, Do it all for the glory of God. If that's our starting point, it at least allows us to have conversation on common ground. In the church in Corinth, they were struggling with what food they were allowed to eat and how communion was supposed to work. Because some people were getting drunk at communion. Can you imagine? They just brought all their food from all the other temples in town. They all got drunk and said, we love Jesus. And Paul had to write to him to say, we're going to have to talk about that. And so when we take communion next week, you'll know we give you grape juice. Part of it spins out of some biblical principles about not causing your brother to stumble, which is a part of this same conversation. These are the sort of biblical principles as followers of Christ we draw out from the scripture in order to apply to our life today. Here's what I want you to know about this new carpet. We want to be a good steward. In 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it says this, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Paul is talking to those who have been given the gospel and he is calling upon them to recognize that what they've been given is not for them to keep, not for them to own, but rather for them to share. This building is a building meant for us to share. Uh, This carpet has been purchased by the money we give to the offerings every week. And because of that, we want to do everything we can to take good care of it. Not just the carpet, though, I would tell you. When we come to worship on Sunday mornings, we say, Lord, help me be a good steward of my time. Help me be a good steward in my relationships. Help me be a good steward with my car. Help me be a good steward at my house. Help me take care of the things that you've given to me. If you do those things... God is able to provide blessing in your life. When we fail to be good stewards, we fail to see the full blessings of God. When Jesus talks about the parable of the good stewards in Matthew 25, to the one who was given 10 talents and multiplied them, Jesus said that the king will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in the little things. I will put you in charge of much. The carpet is not the most important part of who we are or what we do. But you know what? Taking care of all that God has given to us is important to us. There are some churches where when you do something like this, the the pastor will have a a service of the first stain and he'll pour the first cup of red punch or something on the carpet in order to demonstrate that stains will happen and nobody should get too angry about it. I'm I'm not that courageous stupid right that is not the that is not the sense of this congregation that is not the desire we have to put stains down and so I want to tell you in our lives as followers of Christ we are called to be good stewards here's what I want you to know our great goal would be this that we would avoid the stains in the first place you should try to avoid the stains in the first place that's the best answer we can give In Colossians 3, 8, 9, and 10, it says, You must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. And since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Let me give you a life lesson. If you can avoid the mistakes, you are far better off When we come to church, we don't simply come to church to say, God, thank you for forgiving everything I've done wrong. We also come to church to say, God, on this day, help me in this week to come to do everything I can to give you the honor and glory. Help me not to slander. Help me not to lie. Help me not to get angry. Those are the things we come to worship about. The Holy Spirit not only gives us the comfort of God's forgiveness, it gives us the power of his sanctification. I've heard sanctification more in the last two weeks than I had in several years. But somehow God's been putting that in in front of me. Sanctification is the belief in the church that God is making us beyond sin. That God has the power to take us above all of our brokenness. Not that things don't still happen or or physically our bodies fail, but rather spiritually we have the ability to say, God, make me perfect in love. That's the goal. 
Now, how do you avoid stains? Well, let me give you the carpet lesson. Put a lid on your cup. Put a lid on it. Put a lid on it. We have just invested a, uh, another half penny each in our lids. Our, our coffee bar budget's going to go up a little bit because we bought better lids. The old lids, they used to have those little push-in. Maybe some of you still have them today. And they sort of dribble. When I would drink, they would dribble on me. So I would not use cups because it made me look silly. It gave me a stain right down the front of my shirt. Some of you avoid cups and the lids because they're hard. We've got new lids, and these new lids have these little things that, that they pop back and forth. You put them on there, and then it stays open. And then you can drink your, your coffee or your chocolate milk or your orange juice, whatever it is that you've brought. All right. There you go. That's how you do it. Now, some of you are going to say, you know what? I'm not going to bring coffee in at all anymore. We're going to finish our chocolate milk before we come into the Family Life Center. And that is a perfectly good plan. If the Lord burdens your heart to say, you know what? I'm not going to bring anything into the Family Life Center. I am perfectly good with that. And at the same time, in our culture today, it is, it is generally expected from people to offer some sort of refreshment to folks who come particularly in churches that are trying to reach folks who don't normally come to church. In my last church, this whole coffee issue was a big deal because they had a traditional sanctuary with pews and carpet, and they had new people who wanted to bring in coffee and donuts. And you can only imagine what that sort of controversy does in a church. I had to go back about 50 years to their administrative council meetings where they had argued and split previously over indoor plumbing. You have an old church, it goes back far enough that you didn't have indoor plumbing. And some of the old guard said, they don't need indoor plumbing. They can go to the bathroom at home. They should hold it. That's what we did. We never had indoor plumbing. And if they're really desperate, they go over to the pastor's house because that's what we did. And I totally get that. But you know what? If you walked into a church today and they didn't have indoor plumbing, you would be seriously concerned about your welcome at that church. In our culture today, it is a sign of welcome and hospitality. And so we will not ban you. There is no coffee police. There is no donut brigade that will watch over you. But if at all possible, when you get that coffee or that chocolate milk, put a lid on it so that if it tips over, you can pick it right back up again. Now, what's my spiritual verse for this? Well, we're going to take a stretch here and go to James 1.26. Those who consider themselves righteous and do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. So, put a lid on it. <laughs> All right, so here's the goal. Be a good steward. Try to avoid the stain. Put a lid on your cup. All those sorts of good things. And now some of you would like me to stop the sermon and say, that's enough right there. That should be enough. They've heard it. We're not going to have any stains. But the truth is, and you all know this, there are still going to be stains. And if you think right now that you're the person who is never going to have a stain, you better watch out. <laughs> Listen, you hypocrites, God is going to grab a hold of you and you're going to drop the communion cup. You're going to spill your wine. You brood of vipers are going to think you're in a whitewashed tomb, but on the inside, God's going to say, oh, just wait till the next chance I get to watch you fall over. All of us, at some point or another, are going to have a stain. And I don't just mean on the carpet. I mean in our lives. All of us, at some point, fall short of the glory of God. What do we do in that moment? We learn to love each other. In Colossians 3, 12, 13, and 14, Paul is writing to another church struggling to get along and to stay together. And he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Oh, these last two weeks as we've picked up chairs, there have been a few stains that have showed up. And my sinful heart looks at those stains on our new carpet and says, Sinner! But the reality is, in my time here, I've spilled my coffee. Didn't mean to, didn't think it would happen. Thought I'd finish it all. Thought nobody would bother it. And in that moment, when you spill your drink, you would want the same sort of forgiveness in your life that you would now be called upon to offer to someone else. The sinfulness of these lives 
means that all of us face moments where we are in need of God's great grace. And the more we practice offering that to each other, the more we're aware of how much God has already given to us. And so I would tell you that when stains happen, you are still welcome here. We are glad to have your children. We are excited that somebody invited you to come. You are a valued part of this congregation and that nothing should ever make you feel like you do not belong to this family of believers. What should you do if you cause a stain? Clean it up. That's an easy answer. You should clean it up. Here's the next step. Not only should you try to avoid the stain, and not only do you know that you're loved when you make a stain, but once the stain happens, clean it up. The miracle of Scotchgard on this carpet means that this carpet would love to stay clean, that stains will not sink in. And all you have to do is find one of these buckets, grab these rags that will be in these buckets that we will place at the doors, dip it into the water, clean water, no fancy stuff, nothing sold to us by the world, not bleach, not detergent, not anything else. Clean water, warm water on clean rags, find the stain, put the rag down and push it into that stain and then... That water will draw that stain out and that stain will be gone forever and your carpet will be clean. Amen. (laughs) And I'm not just talking about the carpet. Jesus calls upon his people to be baptized. (laughs) And that with the cleansing of water, through the blood on his cross, He takes everything dirty in our lives and every stain and the sin that so easily entangles it and he presses himself into us and through the miracle of God's great grace, he sucks out every sin and makes you clean, amen? When you clean this carpet, it is not hard to do. You just have to get to it as soon as possible. And you just have to know that it doesn't take any magic tricks. There's, no, there's nothing better than this clean water and these rags. And when you pick up the chairs, some of you are going to feel called upon to say, you know what, I can't stack the chairs, but I'll find the stains. But one of the reasons that stains started to appear a lot more in the last couple of years is not because you all got any dirtier, but because the very first past person I met when I came to this church was Wayne Burks. And I met Wayne Burks in that hallway right outside that door. And Wayne Burks came in every week and cleaned the carpet. That's what he did. And Wayne passed away a number of years ago. And more stains started to show up. Not because we were any worse, but because the person who took care of them wasn't there anymore. All of us have a role to play. And as a church goes from one generation to the next, as leadership goes from one generation to the next, as servanthood goes from one generation to the next, we discover there are new roles for all of us to play. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, Paul is writing to this church full of sinners and difficult people. He says, that is what some of you were, past tense. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That is what we are called to do with each other, for each other, and as followers of Christ. To recognize that we are clean, that we have been washed, that we desire to be sanctified. This carpet will last us a long time. The last carpet lasted 16 years. That was amazing. This new carpet might last the same, but this carpet will not last forever. We do not worship the carpet, do not worship the building, do not worship the pastor. All those things are temporary. What do we fix our eyes on? Paul writes to the second letter to the Corinthians. I love that he had to write them twice. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. May you use the carpet and love people and never get those confused. Our last point is this as we finish out. 
to love like Jesus did. Jesus who entered into the mud, the muck, who entered into sinful lives and dealt with people that no one else would touch, who told him he would tear down their temple in three days and build it up again. That Jesus is the one we follow. May his word and his spirit and his teachings always guide who we desire to be. So Lord, we thank you today for your word and pray that your Holy Spirit grabs a hold of our hearts. We thank you for this building and those who came before us. And we thank you for your faithfulness to us every day. We do it all in Christ's name and God's people said, amen. Special thanks to Linda Miller and Cindy Albright and uh, Mikey Shutt who clean the stains for us all week long in this building, who serve us as Christ would call us to serve one another. And so may you have something to share this week at Thanksgiving, a word of hope, a word of peace. May you be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, cast all your requests to God. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. As you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. From this day forward until we all meet again. Amen. God bless. Have a great week.